Hi everyone, my name is Alan Wang. I've been building real-time data infrastructure for the past seven years, first at Netflix for the Keystone Data Pipeline, and currently at DoorDash, building a real-time event processing system called Iguazu. And the journey of building those systems gave me an opportunity to find some common patterns in successful real-time data architectures, which I want to share with you in this talk. In my mind, there are four principles that have passed the test of time. First, decoupling stages. We will talk about what those stages are and why and how to make that decoupling happen. Second, leveraging stream processing framework. We will cover what stream processing framework can do for you and how you can pick one. Third, creating abstractions. For that, I will list the common abstractions that you can create to facilitate the adoption of your system. And finally, fine-grained failure isolation and scalability. Failures will happen. How do you isolate the failures and avoid bottleneck in scalability? I know those concepts may sound a bit abstract at this point, so I'm going to use the real-time event processing system we created at DoorDash as an example to give you some concrete ideas. First, let's talk about use cases of real-time events. At DoorDash, real-time events are an important data source to gain insight into our business and help us make data-driven decisions. Just to give you a few examples how real-time events are used at DoorDash. First, Almost all events need to be reliably transported to our data warehouse Snowflake or, or other online analytical data stores with low latency for business analysis. For example, the Dasher assignment team relies on the assignment events to detect any bugs in their algorithm at near real time. And the second use case is mobile application health monitoring. Some mobile events will be integrated with our time series metric backend for monitoring and alerting so that the teams can quickly identify issues in the latest mobile application releases. The third use case is sessionization. We would like to group user events into sessions and generate session attributes at real time so that we can better analyze user behaviors and push real time recommendations. Historically, DoorDash has a few data pipelines that get data from our legacy monolithic web application and ingest the data into Snowflake. Each pipeline is built differently and can only handle one kind of event. They involve mixed data transports, multiple queuing systems, and multiple third-party data services, which make it really difficult to control the latency, maintain the cost, and identify scalability bottlenecks in operations. So we started to rethink this approach and decided to build a new system to replace those legacy pipelines and address the future event processing needs that we anticipated. First, it should support heterogeneous data sources, including microservices and mobile or web applications, and be able to deliver the events to different destinations. Second, it should provide low latency and reliable data ingest into our data warehouse with a reasonable cost. Third, real-time events should be easily accessible for data consumers. We want to empower all users or teams um, to create their own processing logic and tap into the streams of real-time data. And finally, to improve data quality, we want to have end-to-end -end schema enforcement and schema evolution. So two years ago, we started the journey of creating from scratch a real-time event processing system named Iguazu. An important design decisions we made is to shift the strategy from heavily rely on third-party data services to leveraging open source frameworks that can be customized and better integrated with the DoorDash infrastructure. And fast forward to today, we scaled Iguazu from processing just a few billion events to hundreds of billions of events per day with four nines of delivery rate. And compared to the legacy pipelines, the end-to-end -end latency to Snowflake is reduced from a day to just a few minutes. 
So this is the architecture overview of Iguazu. The data ingestion from microservices and mobile clients are enabled through our Iguazu Kafka proxy before it lands into Kafka. As you can see, we use Apache Kafka for PubSub and decoupling the producers from consumers. Once the data lands into Kafka, we use stream processing applications built on top of Apache Flink for data transformation. And that is achieved through Flink's data stream APIs and Flink SQL. After the stream process is done, the data is sent to different destinations, including S3 for data warehouse and data lake integrations, Redis for real-time features, and Chronosphere for operational metrics. In the following slides, I'll discuss the details of each of those major components. So let's first talk about producing events. The main focus is to make event producing as easy as possible and optimize for the workload of analytical data. And to give more context, let me first explain the requirements for processing analytical data. First, analytical data usually comes with high volume and growth rate. As an example, in the process of making restaurant order on DoorDash, tens of thousands of analytical events are published. Uh, and as we strive to improve user experience and delivery quality, more and more user actions are tracked at fine granularity. And these lead to the higher growth rate of analytical data volume compared with order volume. And therefore, compared with the transactional data, analytical data requires higher scalability and cost efficiency. On the other hand, because analytical data are almost always processed and analyzed in aggregated fashion, minor data loss would not affect the quality of analysis. For example, if you collect 1 million results in an A-B test and randomly drop 100 events from the results, most likely it would not affect the conclusion of the experiment. Typically, we found that data loss of less than 0.1% will be acceptable for, uh, for analytical events. So let's look at the measures that we have taken to ensure the efficiency and the scalability in, in analytical event publishing. As I mentioned in the overview of the Iguazu architecture, we choose Kafka as the central pub subsystem. But one challenge we face is how we can enable every DoorDash service to easily produce events through Kafka. And even though Kafka has been out there for quite some time, there are still teams struggling with the producer internals, tuning the producer properties and making the Kafka connection. And the solution we created is to leverage the Confluence Kafka REST proxy. The proxy provides a central place where we can enhance and optimize event producing functionalities. And it provides abstractions over Kafka with HTTP interface, eliminating the need to configure Kafka connections from all services and making event publishing much easier. The Kafka REST proxy provides all the basic features we need out of the box. One critical feature is that it supports event batching. You probably know that batching is a key factor in improving efficiencies in data processing. But why would it specifically help improving efficiency in event publishing to Kafka? What we have found out is, is that the Kafka broker's workload is highly dependent on the rate of the producing requests. The higher the rate of producing requests, the higher the CPU utilization of the broker, and more brokers will, will likely be needed. So how can you produce to Kafka with high data volume, but at a low rate of produce requests? As the formula in the slide suggests, you need to increase the number of events per request, which essentially means increasing the batch size. Batching comes in with trade-off of higher latency in event publishing. However, <clears throat> produce, um, processing of analytical events are typically done in an asynchronous fashion and does not require sub-second latency in getting back the final results. So small increase in the event publishing latency is an acceptable trade-off. With Kafka REST proxy, you can batch events in each request from client side and rely on the Kafka client in the proxy to further batch them before producing to the broker. 
The result is that you will get the nice effect of event batching across client instances and applications. Let's say you have an application that publishes events at very low rate, which would lead to inefficient batching. But the proxy will be able to mix these low volume events with other high, uh, high volume events in one batch. So it makes event publishing um, very efficient and greatly reduce the workload for the Kafka brokers. The Kafka REST proxy provides all the basic features we need out of the box, but to further improve its performance and scalability, we added our own feature like multicast reproducing and asynchronous request processing. Multicast reproducing means the same proxy can produce to multiple Kafka clusters. Each topic will be mapped to a cluster, and this ensures that we can scale beyond one Kafka cluster. And it also enables us to migrate topics from one Kafka cluster to another, which helps to balance the workload and improve the cost efficiency of Kafka clusters. Asynchronous request processing means the proxy will respond to the produce request as soon as it puts the Kafka records into the Kafka client's producer buffer without waiting for the broker's acknowledgement. And this has a, uh, this has a few uh, advantages. First, it significantly improves the performance of the proxy and helps reduce the back pressure on the proxy's clients. <clears throat> Second, uh, asynchronous request processing means the proxy spend less time block waiting for the broker's uh, response and more time for the proxy to um, process requests, which lead to better batching and throughput. Finally, we understand that this asynchronous mode means clients may not get the actual failure response from the broker and may lead to date loss. To mitigate this issue, we added automated retries on the proxy side on behalf of the client. The number of retries is configurable and each subsequent retry will be done on a randomly picked partition to maximize the chance of success. The result is minimal data loss of less than 0.001% which is well in range of accept acceptable data loss level for analytical events. Now that I have covered events producing, let's focus on what we have done on facilitated event consuming. One important objective for Iguazu is to create a platform for easy data processing. Apache Flink's layered API architecture fits perfectly with this objective. We choose Apache Flink uh, also because of, its, of, because of its low latency processing, native support um, of processing based on event time, um, fault tolerance, and built-in integrations with a right, wide range of sources and syncs, including Kafka, Redis, Elasticsearch, and S3. But ultimately, we need to understand what stream processing framework can do for you we will demonstrate that by looking at a simple Kafka consumer. So this is a typical Kafka consumer. First, it gets records from Kafka in a loop. Then it will update a local state using the records it just retrieves and produce a result from the state. Finally, it will push um, the result to a downstream process, perhaps over the network. On the first look, the code is really simple and does the job. However, questions will arise over the time. First, note that the code does not commit Kafka offset, and this will likely lead to um, failures to provide any delivery guarantee when failures occur. But where should the offset commit be added to the code to provide the desired delivery guarantee, be it at least once, and most ones or exactly ones. Second, the local state object is stored in memory and it will be lost when the consumer crashes. It should be persisted along with the Kafka offset so that the state can be accurately restored upon failure recovery. So how can we persist and restore the state when necessary? And finally, the parallelism of Kafka consumer is limited by the number of partitions of the topic being consumed. 
But what if the bottleneck of the application is in processing of the records or pushing the results to downstream, and we need higher parallelism than the number of partitions? <clears throat> Apparently, it takes more than a simple Kafka consumer to create a scalable and fault-tolerant application. This is where stream processing framework like Flink shines. As shown in this code example, Flink helps you to achieve delivery guarantees, automatically persists and restores uh, application state through checkpointing, and provides a flexible way to assign compute resources to different data operators. And these are just a few examples that stream processing framework can offer. One of the most important features from Flink is a layered APIs. At the bottom, a process function allows engineers to create highly customized code and have precise control on handling events, state, and time. And next level up, Flink offers data stream APIs with the built-in high-level functions to support different aggregations and windowing so that engineers can create a stream processing solution with just a few lines of code. And on the top, we have SQL and table APIs, which offer casual data users the opportunity to write Flink applications in a decorative way using SQL instead of code. So to help people at DoorDash leverage Flink, we have created a stream processing platform. Our platform provides a base Flink Docker image with all the necessary configurations that are well integrated with the rest of DoorDash infrastructure. Flink's high availability setup and the Flink um, internal metrics will be available out of the box. For better failure isolation and ability to scale independently, each Flink job is deployed in a standalone mode as a separate Kubernetes service. And we support two abstractions in our platform, data stream APIs for engineers and the Flink SQL for casual data users. You may be wondering why Flink SQL is an important abstraction we want to leverage. And here's a concrete example. Real-time features are an important component in machine learning um, for data modeling and data, uh, for, for model, model training and prediction. For example, to predict an ETA of a DoorDash delivery order requires up-to-date store order count for each restaurant, which we call a real-time feature. Traditionally, creating a real-time feature requires coding a stream processing application uh, and transforms and aggregates the events into real-time features. Creating a um, Flink application requires a big learning curve for machine learning engineers and becomes a bottleneck when tens or hundreds of features are needed to be created. Uh, and the application created often have a lot of boilerplate code that are replicated across multiple applications. Uh, engineers also take the shortcut to bundle the calculation of multiple features in one application, uh, which lacks failure isolation or the ability to allocate more resources to a specific feature calculation. So to meet those challenges, uh, we decided to create a SQL-based DSL framework called Riviera where all the necessary processing logic and wiring are captured in a YAML file. The YAML file creates a lot of high-level abstractions, for example, connecting to Kafka source uh, and producing to certain things. Uh, and to create a real-time feature, engineers only need to create one YAML file. So Riviera um, achieved great results. Uh, the time needed to develop a new feature is reduced from weeks to hours. And the feature engineering code base is reduced by 70% after migrating to Riviera. And here's a Riviera DSL example uh, to show how Flink SQL is used to calculate store order count for each restaurant, which is an important real-time feature used in production for model prediction. First, you need to specify the source, sync, and the schema used uh, in the application. And in this case, the source is a Kafka topic and the sync is a Redis cluster. The process logic is expressed at the SQL query. You can see that we used the built-in count function to aggregate the order count. Uh, and we also used the hop window. The hop window indicates that you want to um, process the data that are 
uh, that are received in the last 20 minutes and refresh the results every 20 seconds. So in the above two sections, we covered event producing and consuming in Iguazu. However, without a unified event format, it's still difficult for producers and consumers to understand each other. So here we'll discuss the event format and schemas which serve as a protocol between producers and consumers. From the very beginning, we defined a unified event format. The unified event format includes an envelope and payload. The payload contains the schema encoded event properties. The envelope contains context of the event, for example, event creation time. Metadata, including encoding method and the references to the schema. It also includes a non-schematized JSON blob called custom attributes. This JSON section in the envelope gives user a choice where they can store certain data and evolve them freely without going through the formal uh, schema evolution. And this flexibility proves to be useful at early stage of event creation where frequent adjustments of schema definition are expected. And we created a serialization libraries for both event producers and the consumers to interact with this standard event format. In Kafka, the event envelope is stored as a Kafka record header and the schema encoded payload is stored as a record value. Our serialization library takes the responsibility of converting back and forth between the event API and, and the properly encoded Kafka record so that the applications can focus on their main logic. And we heavily leveraged Confluent Schema Register for Generic Data Processing. But first, let me briefly introduce Schema Registry. As we know, Schema is a contract between producers and consumers on data or events that they both interact with. To make sure producers and consumers agree on the, on the schema, one simple way is to present the schema as a POJO class, which is available for both producers and consumers. However, uh, there's no guarantee that the producers and consumers will have the same version of the POJO. And to ensure that a change of the schema is propagated from the producer to the consumer, they must coordinate uh, on when the new POJO class will be made available for each party. Schema registry helps to avoid this manual coordination between producers and consumers on schema changes. It is a standalone REST service to store schemas and serve the schema lookup requests from both producers and consumers using schema IDs. When schema changes are registered with schema registry, it will enforce compatibility rules and reject incompatible schema changes. So to leverage the schema registry for generic data processing, schema ID is embedded in the event payload so that the downstream consumers can look it up from schema registry without relying on the object classes on the runtime class path. Both protobuf and Avro schemas are supported in our serialization library and schema registry. We support protobuf schema because almost all of our microservices are based on gRPC and protobuf supported by a central protobuf Git repository. So to enforce this single source of truth, avoid duplicate schema definition, and to ensure the smooth adoption of Iguazu, we decided to use the protobuf as the primary schema type. But on the other hand, the Avro schema is still better supported than protobuf in most of the data frameworks. So when necessary, our serialization library takes the responsibility of seamlessly converting the protobuf message to Avro format and vice versa. One decision we have to make is when we should allow schema update to happen. And there are two choices, build time or producer's runtime. It is usually tempting um, to let producers freely update the schema at the time of event publishing. And there are some risks associated with that. Uh, it may lead to data loss because any incompatible schema change will fail the schema registry update and cause runtime failures in event publishing. It would also 
um, lead to spikes of schema registry update requests, causing um, potential security issues for the schema registry. So instead, it would be ideal to register and update the schema at build time to catch incompatible schema changes early in the development cycle and reduce the update API call volume to the schema registry. Um, but one challenge we face is how we can centrally automate um, the schema update at build time. The solution we created is to leverage the central repository that manages all of our protobuf schemas and integrate the schema registry update as part of its CI CD process. When a protobuf definition is updated in the pull request, the CI process will validate the change with the schema registry and it will fail if the change is incompatible. And after the CI passes and the pull request merged, the CD process will actually register or update the schema registry and publish the compiled port of jar files. The CI CD process not only eliminates the overhead of manual schema registration, but also guarantees the early detection of incompatible schema changes and the consistency between the released port above class families and the schemas in the schema registry. And ultimately, uh, this automation avoids schema update at runtime and the possible data loss due to incompatible schema changes. So far, we have talked about event producing, consuming, and event format. And in this slide, I'll give some details on our data warehouse integration. Data warehouse integration is one of the key goals of Iguazu. Snowflake is our main data warehouse, and we expect events to be delivered to uh, Snowflake with strong consistency and low latency. The data warehouse integration is implemented as a two-step process. Uh, in the first step, data is consumed by a Flink application from a Kafka topic and uploaded to S3 in the parquet format. And this step leverages S3 to decouple the stream processing from Snowflake so that a Snowflake related failures will not impact stream processing. It will also provide a backfill mechanism from S3 given Kafka's limited retention. And finally, having the parquet files on S3 enables data lake integrations as the parquet data can be easily converted to any desired table format. Uh, and the implementation of uploading data to S3 is done through Flink's streaming file sync. When completing an upload as part of Flink's checkpoint, streaming file sync guarantees strong consistency and exactly once delivery. Streaming file sync also allows customized bucketing on S3, which means you can flexibly partition the data using any fields. And this optimization greatly facilitates the downstream consumers. At the second step, data is copied from S3 to Snowflake tables via Snowpipe. And Snowpipe is a Snowflake service to load data from external storage at near real time. Triggered by SQS messages, Snowpipe copies data from S3 as soon as they become available. Snowpipe also allows simple data transformation during the copy process. And given that the Snowpipe is decorative and easy to use, it's a good alternative compared to doing data transformation in stream processing. And one important thing to know is that um, each event has its own stream processing application for S3 upload and its own Snowpipe. As a result, we can scale pipelines for each event individually and isolate failures. So far, we covered end-to-end -end data flows from clients to data warehouse. And here, we want to discuss the operational aspect of Iguazu and see how we are making it a self-serve to reduce operational burdens. Uh, as you recall, to achieve failure isolation, each event in Iguazu has its own pipeline from Flink job to Snowpipe. And this requires a lot more setup work and makes the operation a challenge. And this diagram shows the complicated steps required to onboard a new event, including create, creation of the Kappa topic, 
schema registration, creation of the uh, Flink stream processing job, and creation of the Snowflake objects. So we really want to automate all these manual steps to improve operational efficiency. <clears throat> but one challenge we face is how we can accomplish it under the infrastructure as code principle. At DoorDash, <clears throat> most, of, of, uh, most of operations from creating Kafka topic to setting up service configurations involves some kind of pull request to different Terraform repositories and requires code review. So how can we automate all these? <clears throat> to solve the issue, we first worked with our infrastructure team to set up the right pull approval process and then automate the pull request using GitHub automation. Essentially, a GitHub app is created where we can programmatically create and merge pull requests. And we also leveraged the Cadence workflow engine and implemented the process as a reliable workflow. And this whole automation reduced the event onboarding time from days to minutes. And we get the best of both worlds, where we achieve automations, but also get versioning all the necessary code reviews and consistent state between our code and the infrastructure. And to get us one step closer to self-serve, <clears throat> we created high-level UIs for user to onboard the event. And this screenshot shows the uh, schema exploration UI where users can search for a schema using regex, pick the right um, schema subject and version, and then onboard the event from there. And this screenshot shows the Snowpipe integration UI where users can review and create Snowflake table schemas and Snowpipe schemas. Most importantly, we created a service called Minions that does the orchestration and have, have it integrated with Slack so that we get uh, notifications on each step it carries out. On this screenshot, you can see about 17 uh, actions it has taken in order to onboard an event, uh, including all the pull requests, launching the Flink job, and creating Snowflake objects. So now that we covered um, the architecture and designs of all the major components in Iguazu, I would like to once again review the four principles that I have emphasized throughout my talk. So the first um, principle is to decouple different stages. You want to use a pop-up or messaging system to decouple data producers from consumers. This not only relieves the producers from back pressure, but also increases the data durability for downstream consumers. And there are a couple of cons considerations you can use when choosing the right pop-up or messaging system. First, it should be simple to use. I tend to choose the one that's built with a single purpose and do it well. Secondly, it, sh it should have high durability and throughput guarantees. And it should be highly scalable, even when there's a lot of consumers and high data fan out. Similarly, stream processing should be decoupled from any down downstream processes uh, including the data warehouse using a cost-effective cloud storage or data lake. And this guarantees that in case there's any failures in the data warehouse, you don't have to stop the stream processing job and you can always use the cheaper storage for backfill. As a second principle, it pays to invest on the right stream processing framework. And there are some considerations you can use when choosing the right stream processing framework. First, it should support multiple abstractions so that you can create different solutions according to the type of the audience. And it should have integrations with sources and syncs you need and support a variety of data formats like Avro, JSON, Protobuf, or Parquet so that you can choose the right data format in the right stage of stream processing. And the third principle is to create abstractions. Um, in my opinion, abstraction is an important factor to facilitate the adoption of any complicated system. 
when it comes to the real-time data infrastructure, infrastructure, there are a few common abstractions worth considering. For example, leveraging Kafka REST proxy, creating event API and serialization library, providing a DSL framework like Flink SQL, and providing high-level high UIs with orchestrations. Finally, you need to have fine-grained failure isolation and scalability. For that purpose, you should aim to um, create independent stream processing jobs or pipelines for each event. This avoids resource contention, isolates failures, and makes it easy to scale each pipeline independently. You will also get the added benefits of being able to provide different SLAs for different events and easily attribute your calls at event level. And because you are creating a lot of independent services and pipelines to, to achieve failure isolation, it is crucial to create orchestration service to automate things and reduce the operational overhead. And here are some final thoughts that go beyond the architecture. First, I find it important to build products using a platform mindset. Ad hoc solutions are not only inefficient, but also difficult to scale and operate. And secondly, picking the right um, framework and creating the right building blocks is crucial to ensure success. Once you have researched and find the sweet spots of those frameworks, you can easily create new products by combining a few building blocks. And this dramatically reduces the time to build new products and the effort to maintain the platform. I would like to use the Kafka REST proxy as an example. We use it initially for event publishing from internal microservices. But when the time comes for us to develop a solution for mobile events, we found the proxy is also a good fit because it supports batching and JSON payload, which are important for mobile events. So with a little enhancement, we made it work as an edge service, which saved us a lot of development time. That's all I have today. Thank you for attending my talk. And please follow us on our tech blogs for more details and the latest developments. Hello. Hi, Sid. How are you doing? OK, yeah. you've been on top, top, top of all of these questions, like a huge number of questions have come in. Um, were there any that you wanted to provide more context on? I'm sorry, the context of uh, of this talk? No, no, the questions. Uh, so uh, you wrote some, for example, there was one about would you use a REST proxy of data option if loss is yeah. not an option? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, remember in the talk, I mentioned uh, that we added the, uh, the actual capability to do asynchronous request processing. So that uh, is designed purely for analytical data uh, mm -hmm. because it would introduce maybe like very minor data loss because we are not giving back the actual uh, broker acknowledgement back to the client. But uh, you can also use the REST proxy in a different way where it will give precisely what, you know, what the uh, um, broker acknowledgement is. So you are you're basically you are adding you are adding a data hop in the middle, but client would know definitely whether this you know uh, you know this this uh, producing request is successful or not, or it can time out. Sometimes you can time out. Let's say uh, you you send something to the proxy and the proxy crash, right? Uh, and then you don't hear anything back from the proxy. But on the on the client side, you will know it's timed out. Then you you will try to re, uh, do, do some kind yes, of retry. Yeah. Mm. Um, another question there, like because for, you were mentioning about throughput, um, you so I'm assuming rec, like rec, uh, REST requests come into the REST proxy, you accumulate it in some buffer, but you're responding back uh, to the REST clients if they're mobile or whatever that you receive the data, but it's uncommitted, and so therefore you can do larger writes and get higher throughput sends. Uh, Correct. Would you also have to change that? Uh, so that yes, yeah, of course that 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 also had to be changed if you are really looking for uh, lossless uh, data publishing. Yeah, that that you, you it's uh, it's not desirable to to have that kind of behavior. Okay, there's another question. Uh, also curious about alternative to Flink. There are two people who asked about your Flink alternatives. Uh, one person is using Akka. 
and uh, they, they're moving off Akka towards Flink and they were wondering what your alternative is. I think you said, uh, I think you haven't responded to that one. No, I haven't. Have you looked at Akka and do you have- No, a... I have to, haven't used Akka before. Um, yeah, Flink is the, the primary one uh, that I use. Uh, I, I think um, Flink probably provides more uh, data processing capability than Akka. Um, mm -hmm including all the abstractions it provide, uh, the SQL mm -hmm. support, uh, and the uh, uh, and the fault tolerance uh, built on top of the, the Flink uh, internal state. Uh, so I, I, I would definitely recommend using either, you know, these kind of frameworks um, mm -hmm. that provide these capabilities. Um, another person asked, also curious about alternatives to Flink. We used to use Airflow plus Beam on Dataflow to build a similar framework. I'm not sure where, how Airflow works in that, but uh, did your team evaluate Beam as well as, and why choose Flink? Uh, we, you shouldn't hear about Beam and Flink, right? Because Beam yeah, is a uh, so, clear about. <laughs> Correct. Um, so uh, I, I, I think Beam does not add a lot of advantages in streaming. Beam is just an API kind of layer, right? And it can right. be used with Spark streaming or with right. Flink. So, so right. unless you want to have the capability of being able to migrate your workload to a completely different stream processing engine, uh, Beam is, is one of those choices that you can use. But I, I also know that uh, some of the built-in functionalities uh, in those stream, uh, stream processing engines are not transferable to to another um, so uh, i think most likely than not than not you are using certain you know built-in functionalities of those stream processing framework which is not exposed uh, with the beam uh, and and the one and so it's actually hard to migrate to, to a different one um, so I, I think beam is a is a very good concept but in reality um I feel it's it's actually more efficient to to stick to to the native uh, stream processing framework. Got it. Because um, because I guess it's a single dialect if the two engines below have the same functionality, but the two func engines are diverging and adding their own. So having yeah. a single dialect is tough. How do you handle retries in the event processing platform? Are there any persistence? Are there any persistence to the problematic events with an eventual reprocessing? Yeah, sure. so uh, so the uh, retries, um, I'm not sure I'm sure what is that context. So in in both uh, the event publishing stage uh, and the event processing stage or consuming stage, you can do retries, right? So mm -hmm. let's say in, in publishing stage, of course, when you when you try to publish something, the broker you know give you a, a, a negative response, you can always retry. Um, uh, and on the processing side, when you consume the data, um, I think, oh, I, think I, likely... I think I understand what they're saying. So what they're saying is, how do you handle retries in the event processing platform? They're asking that, but what they're right. actually, the next one is, if you have a bad message, right. is it, do you persist these away, like in a dead letter queue, yeah. with an eventual reprocessing of it once the, it's patched? Right. So, so, um, so in, in, the, uh, um, in, in the context of data processing or consuming the data, uh, you, uh, when you, if you push something to the downstream and that that failed, or you are processing something that failed, mm -hmm. you can you can still do retry. But I think that letter queue is uh, probably the ultimate answer um, mm -hmm. that you can you know push the the data back to a different Kafka topic, for example, and have uh, the the application consume again from that that letter queue. Uh, and uh, you can you can add a lot of controls on like how how many times you want to retry, how long you want to keep retrying. Uh, but yeah, I think that that queue is essential if you really want to uh, minimize your data loss. Okay, so Kafka question. Apache Kafka is a popular choice, especially for real-time event stream processing. I'm curious of presenters' opinion on simpler event services such as Amazon SNS. How does one decide if you truly need something as powerful as Kafka or perhaps a combination of SNS and SQS for added message durability? Could, could they be enough for a use case? Yeah, uh, I think SNS and SQS have different kind of use cases. They are more like point-to-point -point, uh, messaging system. Uh, but while the but Kafka on the other side, it's really have emphasized on streaming. For example, uh, in Kafka, 
you always consume a batch of messages and your offset commit is, is on the base of batch, not individual uh, messages. And Kafka has another great advantage where you can have different consumers uh, consume from the same queue or, or same topic and, the, and it will not affect each other. So data fan out is, uh, is a, a very good use case of, of Kafka if you need. Mm -hmm. But I think data fan out is a little bit difficult to do with, with SNS and, and SQS. I, I've used a SNS SQS together. Um, I mean, it's basically you combine SNS is topic based, but if you if a consumer joins late, they don't get historical data. Right. So then you you basically have like multiple consumer groups as SQS topics, and then each consumer right. group has to like link to that SQS topic. But the benefit, I mean, the what it what it didn't work for for me is Kafka when the producer writes once it's durable. It doesn't matter how many consumer groups you add later. Right. Right. Different apps. But with SNS SQS, you you end up adding the SQS topic or the SQS queue as another for another consumer group, but there's no historical data. I think that's the difference. Kafka supports that SNS SQS doesn't actually solve that problem. Um, are there any plans in exploring Pulsar to replace Kafka? What are your thoughts on Pulsar if you already explored it? Yeah, so we actually explored Pulsar in my previous job at Netflix. Um, at that time, Pulsar was not that super mature. <laughs> uh, it, it still has some stability issues. Um, but um, the but in the end, I, I think uh, Kafka is uh, is still simpler to use. I think Pulsar is trying to do a lot of things. It's, it's trying to accomplish both, uh, you know, supporting stream processing and also supporting this, you know, point to point to point uh, messaging. It try to accommodate both, and um, it, it becomes a bit more complicated, uh, a complex uh, architecture uh, than, uh, than Kafka. Uh, for example, I think Pulsar relies on uh, another service uh, or, or open source framework called uh, Bookkeeper, right? Apache Bookkeeper. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, there's a multiple layers of, of services in between. Um, and it, you know, deploy, I, we think that deployment, um, you know, installation operation mm -hmm. could be a, a headache. Uh, so, mm -hmm. we, we so we choose Kafka. We want to stick with Kafka for its you know simplicity. Okay. Um, someone asked. I don't know if you answered this one about they're using um, uh, Spring Boot with Avro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I answered one the, about the benefit the of schema separate, registry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Avro schema so build time. Okay. So you have the option of doing build time versus directly hooked in at. I think that option is only a publish time, like producer time. Right. Got it. That's correct. Um, I think we're almost out of time. I have maybe one or two questions left. Were there uh, anything you wanted to share? If someone, if people had questions for you, how would they reach you? Is Twitter a good option? Yeah, Alan, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, there's email. Um, we can do all. We can do all of those. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time, Alan. Uh, lots of amazing questions, lots of interest in your talk. Excellent talk. I loved it the second time I saw it. First time with the QCANESA. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Alan. Thank you, Sid.